All right, welcome, welcome. Don't know whether the sunlight is going to cooperate with us today. Probably it's not going to. But anyway, let's get started here. And I want to go through this review, answer any questions you guys have. We have a test tomorrow, right? Everybody's good with that, right? Hopefully. Test Tuesday, test tomorrow. And we are all done with this chapter. We are also including some sound stuff with it because we never had a test on the sound stuff. And we're going to go ahead and um, probably two-thirds of the test is going to be the mirrors and light stuff, but one-third is going to be the, the sound stuff. So be prepared for that. Be able to, you know, deal with all that kind of stuff. So let's just jump right into the, the review. If you guys have any other questions before that, feel free to ask. And it's good to see a lot of people here with us. We are good for a test tomorrow, right? There's no, I don't think there's any conflicts. Shouldn't be any conflicts. So um, if you have extra time or something, just email me, tell me, hey, I get extra time and no problem. And I might even give, because I know this is like an online thing and you guys have to maybe print it out and take pictures and all that. So I might give you like an extra five minutes or something at the end. So give you guys like an extra little, you know, whatever, whatever time we end, just give me an extra five minutes there. And then everybody else, um, you know, that, that should take care of it, I think. Five, an extra five minutes should take care of it. All right. So, good to see everybody here. Let's jump right into it. You have a trumpet, and it produces a sound with a power of 0.35 watts, right? That's your power um, for your sound. Power is 0.35 watts, and you're 25 meters away, so that's going to be essentially like your R value. So your distance away, or your R in this case, is going to be 25 meters. Units are all fine. What is the sound intensity? So you have the equation for sound intensity, right? Sound intensity is going to be equal to the power over 4 pi r squared, right? Because 4 pi r squared is essentially the surface area of a sphere. And that means this is 0.35 watts divided by 4 pi r is 25 meters squared. Your units are going to be in watts per square meter. I need my calculator for this one. Okay, so most of the stuff is all on the denominator, so you can even just type it in. Sometimes I'll do that. So 4 pi times 25, I don't need this parentheses. Anyway, 4 pi r squared, and then we're going to do 0.35 divided by that is 4.46 times 10 to the minus fifth. Equals 4.46 times 10 to the minus fifth. Now, guys, don't forget about your units. Very, very important. It's so sad when you have to lose a point. You did everything right, but you lose a point just because of units. So these units are going to be watts per square meter for sound intensity. Basically saying that the sound intensity is going to be the same in one place is 25 meters away as some other place 25 meters away. Now that's not exactly true in real life because a trumpet is somewhat directional. Um, now other things, a lot of things are not very directional, but a trumpet is going to be partially directional. And so it would matter exactly where you are, but it's still going to be close to accurate. Next up, um, in addition to the sound intensity, we want to know how many decibels that is. And so decibels are essentially a logarithmic scale of this. And it's a way to just figure out um, the sound level that we would perceive it to be. Because our ears are perceiving things more or less logarithmically. And so that's going to be 10. 10 is for the deci part of it. And the bell is the logarithmic scale. So 10 log, and just a ratio of the intensity, 4.46 to the minus 6 over 10 to the minus 12th, okay? This down here, if you recall, that is the, um, what's it called again? That's the threshold of hearing. And so basically the absolute quietest thing that a healthy person can hear is about 1 times 10 to the minus 12th watts per square meter. These are both watts per square meter, so the units all cancel out there. All right, and so 
essentially if something's zero decibels, if this is one, log of one is zero, and 10 times zero is zero, decibels of zero is about the threshold of hearing. So that's why we divide by 10 to the minus 12. So this divided by, and I'm gonna do it this way, one e negative 12. Now you can do 10 to the negative 12. I find using e to be the easiest way to do this because the e always goes before any parentheses or any kind of order of operation stuff. E is the first thing to be done. That's why I find it to be the easiest. And so I never have to use parentheses with e. And I get this enormous number. And then I'm gonna do 10 log of that. And that's it. So we got 76 decimals. Well, we'll do 76.5. 76.5 decibels. All right, so that is one trumpet 25 meters away, 76.5 decibels. So it's a nice, you can definitely hear it loud and clear, but it's not even close to being painful to your ears. Painful, your, the threshold of pain is about 120 decibels. Although a sound of over 100 decibels for a long period of time would also be damaging. So how many trumpets would need to be played? So if you wanted to have something that's 96.5 decibels, how many trumpets would that be? And let me first say, okay, what about 86.5 decibels? So 10 decibels more. So this is going to be one trumpet. This is going to be 10 trumpets. And this is going to be 100 trumpets. The way this works is because this is a logarithmic scale. And the logarithmic scale is a little bit strange because it's decibels. So really it's 7.65 bells and 8.65 bells and 9.65 bells. So one up in a logarithmic scale is 10 times the amount. All right. You can even calculate this. So how would this work? So if you had 10 trumpets, or let's go all the way down to 100. If you had 100 trumpets, well, what would that mean? That would be, where's my red? 100 trumpets would be 100 times 0.35 because each trumpet is 0.35 watts. So this would be 35 watts. That's what that would be. And you can go back into this equation and even calculate it. Well, 35 watts divided by this, and it's going to be... 10, um, 100 times more here. So it's going to be 4 for 100 trumpets, it's going to be 4.46 times 10 to the minus 3 watts per meter squared, right? And then you can plug that back into this equation. That's going to be 4.46 times 10 to the minus. Um, did I mess up somewhere? Why is this minus 5? Did I, did I, this is a 5, right? I think this is a 5. 4.46, because this is a 5 here. Right, right, yeah. Um, so that's going to be, if I have 100 trumpets, 35 watts, that should be 4.46 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 10 to the minus 12. And that's going to be, essentially, this number is going to be 100 times as big. But then you take the log of that. The log of 100 is what? It's 2. And so 2 times 10 is 20. And that's where you get 20 more decibels out of it. Okay? So you can work that out, work out the math um, with 35 watts if you want to. But in general, if you increase by 10 decibels, it's going to be 10 times the intensity. If you increase by 20 decibels, it's going to be 100 times the intensity. Okay? So an additive increase in decibels by 10 is equivalent to... Mul yes, that is exactly correct, Jeremiah. Yep. If you add 10 decibels, it's the same as multiplying the intensity times 10. And you can work out the math because sometimes it's not entirely obvious, but you can just work out the math, for example, let's say using 35 watts, and that works too. You can work out the math backwards, forwards, and it, it'll work out. But in general, if you just want to have a quick answer, increasing by 10 decibels is 10 times the intensity. Increasing by 100 decibels is, I'm sorry, increasing by 20 decibels is 100 times the intensity. Increasing by 30 decibels is um, 1,000 times the, de um, the intensity, okay? So this is basically times 10 to the 0, times 10 to the 1, times 10 to the 2. And what is this? This is just your decibel, your increase in decibels divided by 10. And this extra 10 just makes the math a little bit less obvious, but that's just the way it works. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, 
I'm going to copy that down. Okay, good. Go ahead and copy that down. Yeah, where does the 35 come from? The 35 comes from 100 trumpets. 0.35 times 100 is 35. Cool? Yeah, there you go. That's right, Adam. All right. And if that is not bothering anybody, and you know what? I'm going to, I'm, you know what's bothering me? The sun. This, this is the worst time of day. Is then the sun comes in and just messes up my lighting. And so as you guys are thinking about that, I'm going to move some stuff briefly. I'll be right, ugh, right back. Let's move this. I don't know. I don't know how much longer this is going to last for. But anyway. Oops. There we go. I know, that's brutal. This is terrible. But anyway, it is what it is. I know I should plan ahead. But the afternoon always just surprises me where the light just comes in. All right. So that's a little bit better. So... Um, number two, if there are no more questions in number one, let's just jump down to number two. What sound intensity of a sound, oops, wait, what is the sound intensity? So we're, we're solving for I, the intensity of a sound that is five decibels. If the sound in frequency is a thousand hertz. Is the sound audible? Okay. So good question. So in general, let me answer the second part first, because that's easier to answer. So five decibels, anything over zero should be audible, except if it's on the edges of our hearing in terms of the frequency, the range of our uh, audible frequencies, like 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz or something like that. And this is kind of right there in the middle. And so because it's right there in the middle, this is going to be the, the frequency that we are most sensitive to. And so therefore, this is going to definitely be audible to any, um, we'll say, yes, it's audible. Although it's going to be very quiet. Audible to any healthy person. Healthy being healthy in the ears, right? Uh, okay. So how do you do intensity? Well, you can, we've done this. We've worked this out before. It's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a pain to go through the logs backwards. And so I have used the equation before. I don't even remember which lesson it was on, but I derived this. But anyway, the intensity you can calculate is 10 to the negative 12th plus your decibels divided by 10, right? How does this work? This negative 12 refers to this 10 to the negative 12th right here, okay? It's your threshold of hearing negative 12. This 10 comes from this 10 right here, okay? And the 10, this big 10, this base 10 is because it's log base 10. So I know that's a lot of numbers to keep track of, but this is going to be so easy for you guys because you guys are, you know, open notes kind of test. So not an issue for you guys. Okay. So this is the equation and we can just plug this in. This is going to be 10 to the negative. Um, well, this is five decibels divided by 10. So that's a half. So this is negative 11.5. So that's, that's going to be pretty small intensity, right? Um, and because this is not a whole number, we're going to go ahead and actually do the calculation. 10 to the negative 11.5. And that's 3.16. Sounds like a nice number. 3.16 times 10 to the negative 12. And that's going to be watts per square meter. Okay? All right. Any questions? Ooh, I'm seeing a lot of questions here. It's a nice day, though. It is a nice day. It is definitely a nice day. I was, it was nice. It was, yesterday it was like hot. It was super nice. Um, it's on the threshold line at the lowest level. Right. So it's basically on the threshold line. It's, it's right there. Um, that's correct. Talking about the graph in the book. Yeah, and I remember that graph. I don't have it on me right this minute, but yeah, it's, it's on the lower end right there. But it's right on there, right on the line. It's like a little tiny bit above the line. And so that is audible to an ordinary healthy person. And you should be able to see that on the graph, look it up on the graph, or just recognize, okay, anything above zero normally is going to be audible unless it's way at the edges. Like if, if I said, you know, for if it was 15 kilohertz, that would probably not be audible because it would be all the way on the edge. Okay. Um, 
Oh, a couple explain questions. I don't know what I'm going to do with these questions when it comes to the test because math questions are a lot more straightforward. But maybe I'll have some explain things. Maybe I won't. I probably won't. But there might be one. You never know. Um, what causes a sonic boom? There's a lot of things that we've talked about. And I, I, there was one day where I basically gave you guys no homework and just said, watch these videos, and read this stuff. And I hope you guys did that. So I hope you guys learned about sonic booms, about radar guns, about... Um, the Doppler effect and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really cool. So what causes a sonic boom? Basically, the sonic boom is when something goes the speed of sound, all right, at the speed of sound. So let's say you have an airplane, and I can't really draw a good, air, good airplane, especially I can't draw a fast airplane. But anyway, so you've got this airplane, right, and let's say it's get the a jet out the back. It's going real fast, right? And it's approaching you at the speed of sound. So the speed that it's traveling is the same speed that the sound is going. So at this point, it gives off a sound wave, right? And at this point, so the, when, the, when the airplane has traveled, whatever, you got it. When the, air, when the airplane, so let's say at this point in time, so you've got this ridiculously loud jet in the back there, right? And so at this point in time, it's going to give off sound right here, right? And it takes, the, as the plane travels this far, right, the sound that's right here also is able to travel that same distance. Now, normally, if it was going slower than the speed of sound, then that sound would actually be um, traveling past the airplane and you'd hear the airplane ahead of time but because it's not because the plane is traveling at the same speed as the sound what happens is all these sound waves they bunch up right so it's giving off all these sound waves and it's hard for me to draw this but you're going to have um, all these sound waves that are going to be building up right here so before while the plane's over here you're not going to hear anything you're going to be you know you're going to be some guy here and you're going to hear nothing, right? You're going to see a plane and you hear nothing. As it comes to you, as it comes to you, all these sound waves as it's coming to you are going to be building up, all right? Actually, maybe they're building up like right behind the plane. But anyway, they're building up. And as soon as the plane gets to you, all the sound waves from way back here, adding up to all these sound waves here, are all adding together to be something super, super, super loud, right? Because you didn't hear it. It's not that it's creating any new noise. It's not. It's just the noise from over here that for all that time you didn't hear, you hear all together, all at the same time. So that's what creates a sonic boom. Waves, sound waves that are bunching up because they're traveling at the same speed as the object moving. All right. How could a police radar gun measure your car's speed? Um, the short answer is the Doppler effect. But the Doppler effect is something that would be an insufficient answer because I want you to explain, okay, what in the world is this Doppler effect? And the Doppler effect is nice because it, it works for any kind of waves, right? So um, it can be for sound waves, like sonar stuff, or it can be for light waves, electromagnetic radiation, right? And for radar and stuff. And so typically, your police radar guns are going to be using radar, right, for this kind of Doppler effect. So what happens is, as a wave, so you have some moving object, right, and, you know, you got some car. Terrible car, but whatever. So you got some car. Oh, okay, you got some guy in the car. And he's driving, whatever. All right. And so as if the car is going, let's say the car is going this direction. Okay. If you send out some light waves or some sound waves, okay, these waves are going to hit the car and they're going to bounce off. And when they bounce off, the, the frequency of those waves are going to change. All right, and so if the car is moving away from you, oh, and I, I should have used a different color, but anyway, um, as the car is moving away from you, 
then those waves are going to spread out, right? And the frequency is going to actually decrease as the waves spread out, right? Or if the waves, as, as it bounces back, so, so it's going to hit there. Um, let's, let's bounce back yellow. All right, here we go. And so when it bounces back, it's going to bounce back. I'm exaggerating here. It's going to bounce back longer. Why? Because when it hits the car, because the car is not a stationary object because it's a moving object that each time that wave hits it's going to be moving further away so one wave hits um, the next time another wave hits the car is in a different spot all right so that's going to lengthen the waves as they bounce back it's going to increase or um, the wavelength and decrease the frequency for the returned wave and you can measure that well how much is this going to increase or decrease so the faster it's moving you're going to know a larger effect and so that's how a radar gun is going to be able to measure the speed of your car, okay? Or if you're going from the other end, if the object is going towards you and you shine this radar gun on it, then the, uh, the reflected light or the reflected waves are going to be bunching up. They're going to be increasing in frequency and decreasing in wavelength, okay? So either way, either way that'll work, whether it's going towards you or away from you, okay? So... Um, the videos I sent you guys before were better drawn than this, so they should make more sense than that. Hopefully that made a little bit of sense. What's the difference between specular and diffuse? Okay, so specular and diffuse. Specular is basically reflection off of a flat surface. Diffuse is reflection off of a rough surface. And so what happens when you have specular reflection you have these light rays coming in and then light rays bouncing out and your light is parallel in parallel out and you're able to get a um, an image image possible off of a flat surface okay now it can be when I say flat I mean that the actual surface of the material is smooth and it could be curved or something. It doesn't have to be flat. So I really should say not flat but smooth. Smooth surface. And you can get an image. Right? When you have diffuse, and this is specular. Diffuse is this. So when you have diffuse, what happens is the light comes in and it's going to be hitting all kinds of things. So as it comes in here, right, it might even bounce back that way. As it comes in here, it's going to reflect out this way. As it comes in here, maybe it will reflect up. So you have light that's, when it reflected, bounces all these different ways. Essentially, an image is impossible. Right? And that's because you have a rough surface. Okay, good enough. Um, does the giant break in the collected molecules make any sound? Hmm, what do you mean? Break in the collected molecules. These are not, these are not, um, these are waves that are bunching up, but, I'm, but you're right in that it's also molecules that are bunching up because when waves bunch up and for sound, you're talking about actual molecules that are bunch, bunching up. And... Okay, you, um, and so the break, you mean like the, the empty space. So as these bunch up, there's going to be other molecules that are spread apart too. Um, I would imagine it would be all part of the same sound, I think, right? So it would be basically just like you have um, for any kind of wave. So you can imagine, you know, any kind of wave right, would not just be this peak, you're going to also have, you know, this trough down here. And it's going to be all bunched up together. And yes, you're going to have some, some that's separated out and then some that's more bunched up, something like that. Um, and I think it would all be part of the same kind of wave. That's, that's kind of what I'm imagining. Um, all part of the same wave. So all part of the same sound, that explosive sound. So 
Um, but that's, that's about as much detail as I, I can give you guys. Okay, the whole collected waves broke apart and that's what causes the sound. No, the, the, the wave isn't breaking apart causing the sound. The, the, the waves themselves are the sound. And so there are, um, and, and it sounds like it's, it sounds like an explosion because, well, actually, I mean, if you, if you ever listen to any kind of jet airplane or something, that jet itself sounds kind of like a, you know, it sounds like something like that, right? And if you take all that sound and bring it together, it's going to be a very loud sound, which will essentially sound like an explosion, okay? It's just all that sound bunched up together, all right? And so the bunching up of the, of the sound waves is bunching up of molecules, which is one sound together, both the peaks and the troughs all there together. And it would be kind of a, a pulse, right? So it wouldn't be a continuous wave. It would be kind of a pulse, but probably all part of the same wave. So that's, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Number six. So we have mirrors. The back page for mirrors, concave, concave, and convex, I think. Okay. Yeah, convex for the last one. So concave spherical mirror has a radius of curvature. So you have R equals 10 centimeters, which means if the R is 10 centimeters, that means F equals 5 centimeters. A candle, which we're going to say is a tree, is 5 centimeters tall. So that's going to be your height of the object is 5 centimeters. And it's placed 15 centimeters in front. So that's going to be a P is 15 centimeters. Draw a ray diagram. And we're going to go ahead and do the calculations first. And we also, we want to know Q, M. So Q, M, and H image. Those are all of our unknowns. So let's go ahead and, and do those calculations and then do the drawing. So I'm going to go ahead and start with 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1 over F. Plug in some numbers here. We have 1 over 15 plus 1 over Q is our unknown equals 1 over 5. And we just want to make sure because this is a concave, so the focal length where the focal point is on the real side of the mirror. So this is indeed a positive number. This isn't a positive number. And P is always a positive number. So those are all positive numbers so far. All right. So let's go ahead and calculate Q. That's going to be 1 over 5 minus. So subtract 1 over 15 for both sides. 1 over 15. And then that we're going to take the inverse of. And we get 7.5. OK. So Q equals 7.5. Also a positive number in this case. So we're expecting, because that's positive, we're expecting a real image. And real images should be inverted. Let's do the calculation to make sure. Your M equals negative Q over P, which is going to be negative 7.5 over what was P again, uh, 15. And 7.5 over 15 is just, that's, um, that's a half, right? So we were expecting negative 1 half. We're, so we're expecting something that's smaller and inverted, right? So real image, smaller and inverted or upside down. So that's kind of what we're expecting based on these numbers. Let's see if we can actually draw it correctly which is not always easy to do, but let's see if we can do it. I'm going to start with the principal axis. Oops. Sorry. And it doesn't matter whether you go it to the left or the right. I'm just going to go this way. And we have, let's make this um, a, an R of 
Now this, I'm um, sorry, that's my F. This is my R. And then I'm going to put my object out there. So this is going to be like 5, 10, and then this is going to be 15. Make my tree like this. And it, it gets a little tricky. Um, one, of the easy, one of the biggest things that's going to mess up stuff is exactly how you draw this mirror. And it's, that's why, you know, if your mirror drawings are not exactly right, it's no big deal because the exact placement of these is tricky, but I, I find the hardest, the biggest place of mistake is going to be where exactly this lens is. Um, because to be accurate, you should actually have this at the center and then draw like a circle, and then you could actually get something a little bit more accurate, but it's kind of hard to do that exactly. Let's go ahead and draw my stuff. So I'm going to do parallel in. Oops, I think I didn't get that. There we go. Parallel in, and then it's going to hit there, and it's going to do the focal point out. And then I'm going to do center in, center out. Just like so. Oops. So center in, center out, like that. All right. And they're going to cross around there. Again, this is going to be kind of approximate. And I, you know, I, it didn't exactly hit the, the mirror there, but it's, it's more or less right. And so where they cross, where the reflected beams cross, that's where your image is going to be. And again, it's supposed, it should be 7.5, should be exactly in between these two. Clearly, I made a little mistake here. Probably, like I said, in terms of exactly how curved this lens is, I'm sorry, this mirror is but it's going to be more or less right, all right? And that's what we're getting at. Notice it's upside down. Notice it's smaller, about half the size. It's inverted, all that kind of stuff. And it's real. It's on this side. So you're getting all that kind of information from this. So that's a pretty good mirror drawing. That's about, you know, I wouldn't expect you guys to get it any better than that. And so, yes, it's not perfectly in between those two, but it's more or less. So that's pretty good, okay? Number seven, concave spherical mirror has a focal length of 23. So let's make that. So we have, in this case, we have F, right? And be careful because sometimes it might give you the radius, like in this problem, or sometimes it might give you the focal length. So be careful with that. So in this case, it's focal length. So F is 23 centimeters. A small tree, nice. I like trees. A small tree. 14 centimeters in front of the mirror, so that's going to be our P, 14 centimeters. Draw a ray diagram, confirm the results. Let's calculate the P, Q and P. Oh, I forgot. We forgot. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I forgot to calculate the image height here. That's the one I forgot to calculate. We did the magnification, but I forgot to do the, um, the height of the image. And so we can even do that one in our heads because it says that the candle is um, five centimeters tall and we know we have a one half magnification. So we're expecting your H image to be negative a half of that. So that's going to be negative 2.5. Or really you can just say 2.5. It's fine either way. Okay. So it's 2.5 centimeters because it's just a height. Right? It is inverted, but the height itself is just 2.5 centimeters. No big deal either way. Because its magnification is one half, it's going to be half the size of the object, and we should expect something to be 2.5. All right, sorry I forgot that. Now, um, next, number seven. Don't see any questions, so I'm going to continue on. We have this. And what are we solving for? Let's go ahead and solve for, let's solve for the Q first, okay? I, in theory, I could have you solve for the Q, I could have you solve for the P, or I could have you solve for the F. It, I probably should have made one of these where you solve for the other things. So my bad. Um, probably on the test, you might have one where you have to solve for P or F or something like that. But, you know, it is what it is. So... We have 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1 over F. And we have 1 over 
14 plus 1 over Q equals 1 over 23. We can go ahead and calculate Q now. 1 divided by 23 minus 1 over 14 is going to be a negative number. Let's take the inverse of that. And we're getting um, negative 35.8. Q equals negative 35.8. So right away, once we know Q, we can already say, well, if that's negative 35.8, we know that this is going to be virtual because Q is negative. And because Q is negative, we know that it's going to be um, upright. Because it's virtual, it's going to be upright. And this is going to end up being a positive magnification. So let's go ahead and calculate the magnification. Magnification is negative Q over P. So that's going to be 35.8. And sorry, we need the units there. Centimeters over 14 centimeters. gives us 2.56. So it's getting bigger. Right? So it's going to be virtual. It's positive, so it's going to be upright, and it's certainly getting bigger. Right? So this might be a little bit more tricky to, to actually draw because it's getting bigger, that much bigger, but let's go ahead and try it out. Okay? So once again, let's draw our principal axis here. And I'm going to, let's draw it the same direction. You can draw it the other direction. Yeah, maybe I'll, yeah, just for variety, I'm going to draw it the other direction this time. Okay? And we have an F of 23 Let's see if I can do something here. Let's just do this in terms of millimeters. That'll make it a little bit easier to get these. So your focal point is 23. Your P is 14. So that's where your object is. And then your center is going to be at, so if that's 23, that's going to be 46. Right, those are our points. So this is your, that's your focal point, and that's your center, and this is where our object is. I'm gonna because I know that this is gonna get big. I'm gonna go ahead and just draw a little tiny tree here, as our object, because I know this is already gonna get big. And it's gonna be very hard to draw it if I make this big. So let's go ahead and try this out. I'm expecting something on this side. I'm gonna do center in, center out. to start. And center in, center out. There we go. And uh, hopefully we actually find that. You know what? I might need to extend that a little bit more. We'll s just extend that a little bit more. All right. And then we're going to do parallel in, focal point out. Or we could do focal point in, parallel out, either way. Let's do this. Parallel in, and then focal point out. Oh, oh shoot, I just I drew that the wrong way. Um, I need to go through the tree, top of the tree. Sorry about that. That is a stray line. Ignore that one. Focal point. Parallel in through the tree, through the top of the tree. And then out through the focal point, like that. Okay. So sorry about that stray line. So these are the ones that are important. Let me even draw over them in 
highlight. So this was parallel in, focal point out, and it's going to be, this is the extended line here, and then this is center in, center out, and then the extended line. So where they cross is over here on the other side, which is exactly what we would expect. They're crossing right around here, and it's getting bigger. And we can see it is behind the mirror, so it is a virtual image. And that distance um, is significantly larger than your, um, your p-value is 14. And this is, should be, actually should be more than twice that. It doesn't look like more than twice that, but you know. So it probably should be over a little bit more to the left. But that's more or less the right spot. So that's good. All right. So I'm kind of running out of time. I'm going to go ahead and go through eight. If you have to come back later, if you've got something going on, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and finish up and do number eight for you guys. And if you want to, you know, check this out later, you're welcome to. You're welcome to do whatever you want. Okay. So last up, you look at a shiny silver ornament with a diameter of 13.6. So D, diameter 13.6 centimeters. So we can go ahead and we'll say, okay, 13.6 divided by two. That's going to give us a radius is 6.8. And that's going to get us a focal length of 3.4. All right, so we got all those. We're not, we don't really need the diameter for anything. It's just sometimes that might be what the problem gives you. So if your eye is five centimeters from the surface of the ornament, determine where the image is. So what that means is the image of your eye. I hope that was clear enough. Where's the image of your eye? Draw the ray diagram and confirm the results calculating these things. Okay. So in this case, uh, once again, we're going to do 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1 over F. Now the focal length, the diameter and the radius are this because you're looking at this because this is a convex mirror, right? And it doesn't tell you in the problems, which makes this one a particularly tricky problem, right? But you know that this is a bulb, and you know it's a sphere, and you're looking on the outside of it. And because you're looking on the outside of it, this focal length must be a negative number, right? And that is an easy place to go wrong for these, right? For all of your convex mirrors, you're always going to be F is negative, okay? Once you got that, you can go ahead and plug in the numbers here. I think we have a P value right, right here. So this is your P. Your eye is five centimeters away. So we're going to do one over five plus one over Q equals one over negative 3.4. So one over negative 3.4, and we're going to do minus 1 over 5. That's going to get us a negative 2. So Q is negative 2, 2.02. .02. So of course we know that that value is negative. It's always going to be negative for your convex mirrors. It's always going to be virtual, right? Which means that it's also going to be upright. And let's go ahead and calculate the magnification here. So magnification, negative Q over P. So that's going to be 2.02 .02 divided by our P of 5. which is 0.405. So it's getting smaller, but it's not terribly small that we can't actually draw the thing. So it's a little bit less than half the size. So upright and smaller. And we'd expect for all of your convex mirrors, which is why you're, you're probably only going to get one convex mirror on the test, you'd expect the thing to be virtual, upright, and smaller. right? All true for convex. So let's go ahead and draw this last one we're going to do.
and let's go let's go um, let's go right this direction okay it has a negative 3.4 Try three point four. We'll do thirty four sixty eight. And the object is on the other side, which is five centimeters, so we'll make that fifty. So that's where your eye is. Instead of your eye, we're going to be drawing a tree and this is the convex mirror right here I probably made that thing a little bit too big but hey it'll be good because we need to make this this thing the image we know already is going to be fairly small right so we're going to do parallel in once it hits the mirror it's going to reflect out through the focal point which is right here but I got stuff there, so I'm not going to reflect that way. I'm just going to do the extension of the reflected light is going to go this direction. Okay? The actual reflected light is going to go that way. Okay? And then we're going to do center in, center out, which is the easiest one to do most of the time. Right from the top of the tree. And then back in the virtual area over here. Okay? And they cross always on the inside in the virtual space of the mirror for your convex mirrors which is right here and we get exactly what we'd expect we get something that's smaller and we have some value for your q with the negative two which is smaller than the, um, the focal length of 3.4 and so it's yeah it's smaller than that so that's pretty reasonable that's a good ray diagram for something like that okay so for those of you guys who stuck with me the whole time Thank you guys. Do we have any questions before we sign out? So we have test tomorrow, same time, same place. So go to Google Classroom, get on Google Classroom, and I'll give you guys like, you know, 50 minutes or so to do the test. Any questions at all? This will be a normal length test, and it'll involve all these kinds of mirrors and a little bit of sound stuff. Any questions? If there are no questions, I'm just going to sign out. All right. Have a great... Um, do you care which way we do it? No, don't care. You mean like left or right? No, I don't care about that at all. And I don't even care if you don't like to do center in, center out. That's fine. You can do the parallel in, um, focal point out, and then focal point in, parallel out. That works too. So I don't care. Well, anything on color polarization? Oh, yeah, maybe. There might be, good, good question. We just did that on our last homework. I'm thinking there's a good chance that there might be some question like that. Although, once again, I haven't completely put together this test. Um, you might see something like that on there. But I don't expect it to be anything too crazy. So, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. I might, I might just not think of a good question and then just not put it on there. Anyway, so let's go ahead and just end there. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Love, enjoy the weather, and stay safe. See you guys.